Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the April meeting of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with our group, uh, we're a Pennsylvania nonprofit group. Um, our purpose is to research, document, and convey the history of the Squirrel Hill area, um, which we've been doing for about 22 years. Um, in addition to having a program each month, we also publish a newsletter which can be viewed on our website at the end of each month. Um, let me start by recognizing some of the volunteers who make all this possible. Okay. We um, have uh, co-presidents, myself, Wayne Bossinger, and Jim Hammond, Vice President, Helen Wilson. Um, other board members, Gene Benstock, Toby Chapman, Audrey Glickman, Tony Indovina, Stanley Klein, Todd Miller, Evelyn Young, and also we have uh, former president, Michael Irwin. Um, we have a number of interesting programs scheduled for the coming months. In May, uh, George Guido, author of Neighborhoods of the Allegheny Kiskey Valley will talk about the rich history of 30 neighborhoods in these two river valleys. Why is my cursor not working? Um, in June, uh, Squirrel Hill Historic Society board member Tony and Davina will report on progress being made in the restoration of the Neil Log House in Shumley Park, which is the oldest residential building in the city. Um, Tony also serves as president of the Friends of the old log house. It's the organization behind the restoration. Um, July's program is titled The Family Clubs of Squirrel Hill, and it will be presented by Eric G., director of the Royal Jewish History Program and Archives at the Center of John Hines History Center. Tonight's speaker is Roz Sherman, a retired teacher who taught for many years at Taylor Roller Ice High School. Uh, during her years there, she met many interesting characters, to say the least. And she'll detail this in tonight's presentation. Uh, the presentation is broken down into several subtopics, and at the end of each one, there'll be an opportunity for listeners to tell their own stories. Uh, we encourage listeners to do that. That being said, I'll pass the mic on to Ross. There's a request to turn on closed captioning. Can you do that? Before I begin, I want to express my appreciation to the leadership of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, Tony and Davina, Todd Miller, Wayne Bossinger, Helen Wilson, Audrey Glickman, um, working out all of the logistics and technology for my presentation. I literally could not have done it without them. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank my own personal computer guru, Karen Kendall at East, East End Concierge Service for being available literally day and night uh, to fly over to my home uh, to help me with the PowerPoint. 
Uh, also, Eric Liggy at the RAL Archives at the Heinz History Center. Um, you might be interested to know that the Heinz his, that the RAL Archives at the History Center has almost, not all, but almost all of the Aldred Ice yearbooks. Um, and his help was invaluable. And finally, I would like to thank you for taking this walk through the decades and for being the characters of Taylor Alderdice. There is a saying that truth is stranger than fiction and some of you are perfect examples of that. Uh, I was a student from 1957 to 1962 and a teacher at Alderdice from 66 to 99. So it's a span of about 40 years. Those of you who went to Alderdice will um, recognize some but not necessarily all of the images because you came at the end or you came in the middle or you came at the beginning of when I was teaching. Um, this audience is actually divided into two generations. Um, those who attended, you can go to that one. Those who attended Alderdice before the addition was put on the building. And you see the beautiful lawn that we had and the beautiful uh, columns that we had, and this is the way it looks now. Yes, um, a very different looking school. Um, many of you attended Alderdice like I did when there were 3,200 students in the building, and they were, we were all bursting at the seams. Now there are only about 1,500 with more space from the addition um, to the two gyms and the swimming pool that were added. I'd like to start by just talking for two minutes about the administrators. You may not recognize this person. I don't think most of you go back that far. But this is Roland Deves. He was the first principal of Alderdice in 1927. The next slide. I threw in a few cartoons that I thought you would enjoy. Okay, the next face that you're going to see is the real deal, Taylor Alderdice. He was a member of the school board, the first school board in Pittsburgh. He lived in Squirrel Hill. He was the president of the National Tube Company, which was a subsidiary of U.S. Steel at the time. Um, the first administrator that I'm going to talk briefly about, and we're skipping here because my talk is much too long. Yeah, keep going. Next. Okay. Uh, many of you will remember this is Hal Teal. He was vice principal for many years and then he became principal. Um, I have two very strong memories of Hal Teal. The first one was every month we had to have a faculty meeting after school for 45 minutes, something like that. And it was up to the principal to decide how it was spent. Dr. Teal took all of the memos that had been sent to him over that month and copied them and handed them out to us as we walked in the door. And after we all sat down with these memos in our hands, he proceeded to read every last one of them. And I will never forget sitting there dying of boredom. 
Uh, the second thing that I remember about him is that his last couple of years at Alderdice were a very chaotic time. There were fights, there were demonstrations, there was violence, um, and Dr. Teal, unfortunately, was not able to deal with it. I have a very vivid memory of sitting in his office. He had a beautiful mahogany desk with a glass top over it. And I was so distraught at what was happening in the school that I was just crying and crying and crying. And I can still see my tears dropping on his glass desktop. Those are my memories of Hal Teal. Okay, now we're going to skip those. I know Wilson, Miss Zinn, most of you didn't know her because she was more the uh, teacher's contacts than the students. But this person you should remember. This is Donald Siemens. He was the vice principal at Alderdice. Um, I first knew him as the gym teacher at Colfax. And then he became the vice principal at Alderdice. Um, okay. <laughs> there were, I had lots of complaints about the lack of discipline in the school. And when I would go down to complain to him, he would say to me, Mrs. Sherman, most teachers would be thrilled to have as much order in the classroom as you have. Uh, that was really a backhanded insult, and I resented it. Um, he told a, a teacher that he knew I was angry with him, and uh, made the comment that Mrs. Sherman was after his ass. And when I heard that, I responded, no, it was not his ass I was after, it was his head, uh, preferably on a platter. Now we're going to stop briefly and open it to see if anybody has any comments or questions about the administrators before we move into the infamous uh, William A.G. Fisher. Anybody want to comment? If you have something to say, you have to unmute yourself. Nobody has anything to say. Okay, in that case. Yes. It's Sarah Weinberg. How are you? Who? Sarah Weinberg. Cronley. Sarah Cronley Weinberg. Okay. How are you? Yes. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Where are you right now? I can't hear your question. Where are you right now? Oh. Where are you? Um, the. Um, Squirrel Hill Historical Society meets monthly at the Church of the Redeemer oh, next sure. to the JCC on Darlington. Yes. yes, so you're here in Pittsburgh. Yes, in Pittsburgh, okay. right. And um, hopefully we will start having live meetings again very soon. That would be great. I'd like to participate yeah. they are, in Pittsburgh. They really are a wonderful organization. Wonderful. My question, do you remember, I can't remember who it was at the Board of Education that interviewed us for our jobs at Alderdice because we were going to both be doing special classes. And I remember distinctly a comment he made to me, and I think he made it to you, that why should we hire you? You are just going to get married and leave. Right, right. Absolutely. It was insulting to women. Uh, fortunately for me, I was coming through at a time when there was about a 
30% turnover in teachers every single year in Pittsburgh. They were the wives of uh, guys who were in medical school and law school, and they taught for a couple of years to support their husbands. And as soon as their husbands finished, they picked up and moved, and they were looking for more teachers. So we had a lot of turnover in those late 60s, early 70s. I remember I came on with you, but that's what he said to me, even with a 40% turnover of all the, of the older teachers retiring. And they said that women were just going to get married and leave, so they right. didn't really want to have them. Right, yeah. That, that was a problem until um, legislation was passed. <laughs> yep. Okay, anybody else? Okay, shall we move on? A.G. Fisher was the principal of Taylor Aldergeist from 1971 to 1991. Um, he was as different from Dr. Teal as night and day. He was determined to bring order to the school, and he did. Um, some of you may remember him driving up to Rhoda's Deli on Murray Avenue or the Hot Puppy Shop on Forward Avenue and chasing the kids out and telling them to get back to school. Uh, he was very affectionate towards his students, hugging, kissing. Um, another shot here? Not that one. Yeah. <laughs> I came across this in a yearbook, and I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. He was a heavy smoker at the beginning, and then no, no people in the building were allowed to smoke anymore, and he had to quit. But I would like to point out to you that his smoking in the late 60s and, I'm sorry, the early 70s was very different from... This smoking, which some of you possibly can relate to, um, he was smoking on the inside, and these folks were smoking on the, the outside. Uh, there was a lot of that in Alderdice at the time. Um, here is another picture of Mr. Fisher. I believe that is Betty Roseboro, a teacher. But he was always hugging students, kissing students, wrapping his arms around them, giving them bear hugs, and it's, <laughs> I wonder what would happen if he were still principal today. <laughs> there are laws against that kind of thing now. Um, one run-in that I had with Mr. Fisher was that he was always telling teachers that they needed to stand at their classroom doors in order to patrol the halls and make sure that there was no trouble. And it was very difficult for me because during the change of class, there were always kids leaving who wanted to say something to me and kids coming in who wanted to say something to me. And I tried to get to the door, but it didn't happen very often. And I remember him standing in the doorway of my classroom bellowing Mrs. Sherman, please come and stand by the door. And I walked to the door and I said, okay, I would like you to stand with me for just a minute or two. And so he stood beside me. You might remember that the girls' bathroom was directly across the hall from my classroom. And as we stood there during the change of class, 
Every time the door opened, the waft of smoke and marijuana came rushing through the halls and was enough to knock you over. And he stood there for a minute or two, didn't say a word, and he finally just walked away. And he never asked me again to stand at my door. Um, I have a few pictures of myself that some of you may remember. Which Mrs. Sherman do you remember? This was the one near the beginning of my career in the late 60s and 70s when I was a, a newbie. And this, no, 21, can we go back? Yes. This was a time when so many students at Alder Day had afros, and this was my Isro. And um, a lot of you may remember that. Uh, this next picture was, um, I guess, in the 80s. And the last one is basically what I looked like when I retired in 1999. So, moving on, um, I would like to talk about some of the faculty. I hope you can see that cartoon, I really liked it. Why is an A or B better than a C or D? Aren't all letters equal in the eyes of God? I love that cartoon. Okay, so here we have teachers. Herb Bunting. He was the band teacher. I barely orchestra. knew him. Orchestra. Orchestra. I barely knew him, but my friend Audrey Glickman here has vivid memories of him and would like to say something about Herb Bunting. Thank you, Mrs. Sherman. <laughs> he was the orchestra teacher, Mr. D. Pasquale oh, was sorry. the band. I told it was you a I didn't big know. Big competition. Yes. So, a couple things Mr. Bunting used to say: music is organized noise, and he would he would say the rhythm of music is based on beats, and music cannot begin in a sea of noise. We we were never quiet. It took us about half the class to get to be quiet. And when we would dismiss class, even though it was 11.20 in the morning, he would say, that's all for tonight. <laughs> he was great. He only recently passed away. He was a wonderful teacher. Thank you, Mrs. Sherman. My pleasure. Okay, moving on. Can we go to the next one? Yes, this was Lu uh, Louise, I'm sorry, Virginia Lewis. Some of you knew her as Mrs. Lowe. She got married um, at, while she was teaching at Alderdice, and her name changed from Lewis to Lowe. She was a wonderful choir teacher. Anybody who was in the choir knows what a magnificent job she did. The highlight of the choir every year was the Christmas program right before Christmas vacation. Um, every year the choir sang the Hallelujah Chorus and Virginia would invite any alumni who had been in the choir in past years to come up on the stage and sing with the current choir. And there were times when there were 200 kids on that stage. Uh, she was a marvelous teacher. Um, this is a mystery man. I recognize him, but I have no idea what his name is. Does anybody know who this is? If you do, please unmute yourself and tell me. Nobody Looks knows. like Mr. Rankin, a physics teacher. What was his name? Uh, Rankin. Grace is Rankin. 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 Thank you. Rankin. Mr. Rankin. Yes. He, um, yes, he would go to our faculty meetings once a month and he would sit there with his trench coat folded over his arm and 
at he be looking at his watch with the other hand, and at the second of three o'clock, he stood up and walked out. <laughs> and the administrators just stood there and watched him go. He was really amazing. He had a big box that he called the rank and file. I'm sorry? Oh, Dr. Hackett? Huh? Yeah, um, there were a lot of those teachers that were around when I was a student, but I took as little science and math as I possibly could. So I didn't know most of them, but they were, there were some interesting characters. Mrs. Sherman, Robin Bloom, Friedman here. One of that picture you put in the beginning with uh, uh, Mr. Fisher, and you, I think you referenced it maybe being a teacher. That's Diana Motter from the class of 1982. <laughs> Robin? <laughs> that was right out of our yearbook. Robin, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Or at too. least your name. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on. That is Dr. Uh, Hackett. I was wrong about Rankin. Oh. Yeah, he lived back in the 30s continually and never moved on. He would talk about <laughs> driving his touring car around. <laughs> okay, um, moving on. Um, this is someone that uh, you will recognize. This is a very young Dr. Dora Slipman. Uh, she was a teacher, a science teacher. Then she was department chair. Then she was the science supervisor of the Pittsburgh Public School. And then she was the director of the CAS program for the Pittsburgh Public Schools. Um, she was an extraordinary teacher. She had a Oh, uh, I can't remember if it was an alligator or a crocodile. Do you remember? It was a caiman. It was a caiman in her basement, and she had an enormous tank built for this caiman, and he swam around in the tank all day, and he only ate once a week, and he only ate chicken necks, but he would not eat chicken necks that were frozen. So every Thursday afternoon, Doris would hit Murray Avenue and go to all the kosher butcher shops and collect all of the chicken necks that were being prepared for Friday night dinner. And she would take them home to Ernst. That was his name, Ernst. Um, poor Ernst is no longer with us. Okay, a few more. Some of you know this man, Irv Topp. Um, I'm really not going to say too much about him. Um, he fought with everybody in the school. He fought with the faculty, he fought with the principals, he fought with the students, he fought with the students' parents. Um, he sued several people, if I remember correctly, and he was a very uh, angry person. Okay, let's move on. Maxine Wedby. Maxine Wedby was the Spanish teacher and chair of the, of the uh, department, foreign language department. Uh, at some point in her life, she lived in Louisville, Kentucky, right next door to a family by the name of Clay. Now think about that. Louisville, Clay, as in Cassius Clay. She lived next door to Muhammad Ali when he was growing up. And whenever she would talk about him, she always said he was the nicest young man. He always said, yes, ma'am, and no, sir. And he was just such a pleasure. And I can't imagine why he would ever want to go into boxing. Well, a few million dollars might have something to do with it. Um, okay, next is, whoops, sorry, 
Sam Adia. He was the Latin teacher at Alderdice. I'm not sure whether he was fired or resigned because he had an apartment in Oakland and had pot parties in his apartment to which some students were invited. And that was the end of Sam Adia. Next. Tony Yenius. He was, I believe, the German teacher. Mm -hmm. He spoke four or five different languages. He was really fluent and very bright, but he was enormously obese. Enormously obese. And he would come into the teacher's room at lunchtime with a plate and a fork and a can of Spam, S-P-A-M. And he would use the key to unroll the lid of the Spam and he would <laughs> dump it onto his plate with all the gelatin and all the juices all running all over the place and proceed to eat it. And the rest of us very politely got up and moved away. But he was a nice man. Okay, the next one is Helen Siki. She was the French teacher. Um, she was the epitome of an old maid school teacher. Um, the, the story that I love about Miss Siki was, you know, she had her bun pulled in the back and she wore sensible Oxfords and, I mean, she was the epitome of an old maid school teacher, except I was shocked to find that she was a rabid supporter of the teachers' union. And in the 19, late 60s, when we were going out on strike, she was right there picketing with the rest of us with a big sign across her chest, uh, Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers. And she was walking with two of the big husky gym teachers, one on each side of her. And the police came up and said, you are trespassing on public property. We're sorry. We have to arrest you. And they pushed the two gym teachers out of the way and arrested Helen Siki <laughs> and took her to jail. And she had to post bail to get out. Amazing. Okay, the next one is the Spanish teacher, Lillian Goldstein. Um, she and her sister were both uh, other examples of old maid school teachers. Her sister taught at H.B. Davis School. She was my first grade teacher. And Lillian here taught Spanish at Alderdice. The two of them took a trip to Latin America one summer and came back and I overheard her talking to some teachers saying what a wonderful time she had in Latin America, and she had no trouble understanding the Spanish, except in Brazil. And she couldn't figure out why she didn't understand the Spanish in Brazil. Could be because they spoke Portuguese. She evidently did not know that. Okay, I will stop again a little bit few minutes. Anybody want to say anything? I do. Quickly. Graduate. Please. It's Ray Baum. You and I went to school together. You graduated six months Yes, we that. did. Um, there were a couple of things. Uh, Olive Boland, I don't know if you're going to say anything about her, but she was the Latin teacher and her main, uh, the main thing that, that, what I remember about her, that everybody else Miss Boland, is that what you're saying? Yes. What did she teach? Latin. Latin, okay. And her, the main thing you remember from her is she always had to tell you, Kume in Portland, which means throw your gum in the wastebasket. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and, and the, the, the principal before, uh, Mr. T, 
Teal, who is Mr. McClymonds. Mr. McClymonds. I had a picture of him, but I didn't have time. We, we just have to move on. And he, he caught me cutting class one day, and my punishment was I had to have lunch with him in front of everybody. Wow. In the cafeteria. <laughs> but you live to tell about it. Yes, and, and when a nerve top graduated, <laughs> a nerve top got me through chemistry, but, and became, he was the chemistry teacher at all the days, and his claim to fame was he made all the girls wearing short skirts sit in the front row. Who was this? Earth Top. Oh, Earth Top, yeah. We, we had a few names for Mr. Top on those lines. Yeah. I, I, I really, I was trying to be diplomatic, we'll but... Just leave it at he was yes. not a nice person. Ross, uh, Elaine Berkowitz, may I say something? Sure. Um, I'm a dentist, and Miss Seeky was my patient uh, towards the end of her life. She was my patient, and I had just come back from Mexico. When I saw her name on my schedule, I thought, oh my God, it has to be her. So I said, Miss Seeky, you were my French teacher. And she said, oh yeah, what can you say? Well, I counted to ten, I couldn't remember a whole lot. But it's very similar. <laughs> She was a wonderful teacher. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. And we yes, always was knew when spring had come because yes. she took off her brown and black Oxfords and put on her beige Oxfords. And that, that was the sign that spring had come. She was very thin when we knew her, but she was very heavy set in later years. Really? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, anybody else have something to say? Yes, Ms. Sherman. Please. My name is Amy Lichter Harrington, and you were my teacher back in 10th grade. Okay. I wanted just to say... What was your maiden name? Lichter. Lichter. Yes. Okay. You may not remember me, but I remember you, and you were my very favorite history teacher of all, and it is... Um, you gave me the basis for understanding history. Thank you. Just the culture of history. Yes, like world culture. History. Do you, did you remember the phrase that you will remember on your deathbed? I do not. Frame of reference. reference. Right. <laughs> we all have a frame of reference, right? That was drummed into their heads. Yes, frame of reference. And I am a teacher now, but I teach math. I teach high school math. Oh, but, uh, ooh. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> Well, I'm glad you could join us. Okay, anybody else before we move on? Okay. Um, another cartoon. I thought this was cute. Teachers never tell you their first names because they don't want you to Google them. <laughs> and I'll bet that happens. This is someone that many of you may remember. Um, Bud Valeni, Martin Valeni. He was my geometry teacher. I was absolutely terrified of him. He didn't yell. Um, he just destroyed you with sarcasm and ridicule. And I was absolutely terrified because I was so poor in math. Um, I will say that he took pity on me and only made me go to the board when I had my hand raised. And I am very grateful to him for that. Uh, later on in his teaching career, he wore dentures. He had to have all of his teeth removed. And he put them on a chain that he wore around his neck. And everybody who walked into his class, classroom got to see Bud Valeni's teeth. And they were not pretty. Trust me on that. Okay, next, Dick Wells. Dick was an English teacher. He was his own person, and people either loved him or hated him. Uh, if you crossed him, he would verbally cut you down to shreds. 
uh, most nights you could see him sitting at the bar in Sodini's restaurant on Wilkins Avenue, if you remember the old Sodini's. Um, and when he died, I always thought that a proper memorial for him would be to have one of those bar stools bronzed with his name on it. He spent a lot of time there. Next. <laughs> In addition to Mr. Valenti, this was the other teacher that terrified me, Wayne Sommerfeld. He was a terrific teacher, but he always reminded me of a drill sergeant. Do this, do that, stand up, sit down, go here, go there. Um, I remember my senior year of high school when I had him. I was walking down Walnut Street in Shadyside, and I saw him coming towards me. And I could feel my heart starting to pound and my knees getting weak, and I literally did not know what to do. Should I turn around and run away? Should I cross the street? Should I wait for him to come up to me? And in the end, we passed like ships in the night, and he said hello, and I said hello. But truly, I was amazed to see that Wayne Sommerfeld walked the streets just like the rest of us. Uh, this is Chaz Hirsch, social studies teacher. We are going to skip him. We are going to skip him. We are going to skip her. We are going, keep going. Oh, Roland Gargani. Roland Gargani was a social studies teacher across the hall from my math teacher, Miss Wingerson, and the two of them got married and lived happily ever after, after. He evidently wore dentures, and every once in a while the dentures would slip, and he would talk like that, and he would very quickly turn his back to the class and push the dentures back into his mouth, turn around, and start teaching again. Okay. This was Bruce Forey. He was my supervising teacher while I was student teaching. He was a master teacher, and I ended up with a true inferiority complex that I never truly got over. My first day of student teaching with him was absolutely the worst day of my entire teaching career. Um, the lesson was about the culture of the African Bantu tribe. And the point of the lesson was to show uh, that they were a very warlike, militaristic group that would be um, no easy um, defeat for the uh, Dutch Boers that were moving north from South Africa. Uh, I had a perfect lesson. I uh, was going to ask the students to give me examples of things that they remembered about uh, the Bantu, and I was going to write them on the board, and then at the end I would say, now, what does all of this show you about the values of the Bantu? And they would all say their marriage ceremonies, their initiation rites, everything was intended to... Um, um, to teach you to be a good, brave soldier. Well, the third person I called on in the class will forever be burned in my memory. I won't say his last name, but his first name was Ezra. He was the third kid I called on, and in less than one minute, he taught my whole lesson. Um, this is the evidence, and this is the point that we want to come out with. And I just stood there. I didn't know what to do. I just stood there praying that, that the earth would open up and take me. And finally, Mr. Forey came from the back of the room and took over the class, 
and did what I would have done a few years later. I would have said, okay, here's Ezra's hypothesis. Let's put it on the board. Now let's look for the evidence to support it. I wasn't bright enough to do that when I was student teaching. Um, it was terrible. It was terrible. Okay, I'm going to stop again briefly, and then I'm going to go on. Anybody else have something to say? Are you going to get the Mrs. Mussoff? Lenore Mussoff. Lenore? Yes. No. She was, she was at our classes. Fabulous. Yes. She and was she came to all fabulous teacher. Here. Right. And, and when she and her work. husband, when she and her husband moved to Fairfax County, Virginia, my sister, who was already teaching there, helped to get her a job. And they loved her. Okay, we yeah, have to yeah, move in. I'm running. Oh, somebody reunion. else? Yeah, Ray wanted to say something. Ray. Right. the reunion, she did stand up for half an hour at the age of 87. She came? She came and she did stand up comedy for at least a half an hour. Ah. Uh, she, was, she was quite a teacher. Okay. Um, unfortunately, most of the real, true characters who taught at Alderdice, I could not find pictures of. I truly think that they refused to have their pictures taken. I looked in 20 different yearbooks and couldn't find these people, but I just want to mention them to you because I'm sure you will remember some of them. One of them was an elderly science teacher by the name of Coach Irvin. He had two paddles, a short one called Mrs. Santa Claus and a long one called Mr. Santa Claus. And if you misbehaved, you got whacked. The next one is uh, someone you may recall, Boom Boom Beck. Does that ring a bell with anybody? He was a social studies teacher, uh, but he was my homeroom teacher and he had a loud, booming voice. And when he would get angry at the kids, he would yell, you can't talk to me like that. I have a son in medical school. <laughs> Go figure. Um, then there was Crazy Annie Cagnets. She was also a social studies teacher. Um, truly crazy. I don't have time to go into all of the details, but um, she should have retired long, long before she did. And um, finally, <laughs> Kate Skorinsky, yes. the famous, infamous Kate Skorinsky. She was the typing teacher. She was a, a big woman. She always wore what my mother used to call a house dress. Um, she had terrible posture. She was slumped over like this, and she always wore what looked like men's shoes. And she would walk up and down the aisles of the typewriters yelling, Heads up! Heads up! Don't look at your hands! Heads up! Don't look at your hands! <laughs> she was pretty terrifying, but as Many people will tell you she taught us to type. Can I tell you something about Ms. Jurinsky? Oh, absolutely. I... Please do. So I was in Mr. Wiggins' homeroom, and it was across the hall from her, and he used to drive her crazy. And I was one of the tallest girls in, in the class, and he was a tall man. And when she put on her typewriting records, he and I would waltz into her room. Oh, did she have a fit. <laughs> he loved making her crazy. It was the funniest thing. <laughs> I could not, I, I'm telling you, I looked in one yearbook after another. When they took individual pictures of teachers, hers wasn't there. When they took group pictures of the business department, she wasn't there. Okay, moving on to um, some students. Did you talk about Mr. Spillane at all? Have who? Did you talk about Mr. Spillane? Spillane? Yeah. No. He was the math teacher 
teacher that, that dated the, the other math teacher across the hall. Oh, there were so many characters at Aldernice. They were amazing. Twenty years later, I, I was a teacher, and he was the vice principal. So one day, I took cookies into everybody in the office, and he said, "What did I give you in math?" I said, "A C." He said, "Well, if I'd known you were such a good cook, I would have given you a B." <laughs> yeah, we we really had them. Uh, I would like to. We're almost out of town, and I would like to um, talk about a few students that I have known. Um, this you may recall was the standard uniform of students in the late 60s and 70s. You can see there are both boys and girls standing there. That was a standard uniform for every kid in the school. And if you go to the next one, I took a picture of this yearbook because I thought it was so interesting if you don't look at the faces, you would never know who the boys were and who the girls were. They all had the same long hairdos. Okay. Some of you will remember this from the late 60s and 70s. We had student strikes. We had walkouts. We had sit-ins. We had riots, we had demonstrations, we had it all. Um, it was a wild time as, at Alderdice if you were there. Okay, this is the infamous wall. This was a student in my first homeroom, my first year of teaching. They were 18 years old, and I was only 21, and if they had ever found out that I was only three years older than them, that would have been the end of it. Uh, he was absolutely uncontrollable. His name was Clarence, and he wouldn't listen to one thing that I said. And when I would tell him he had to sit down, um, he sat down when we were pledging allegiance to the flag. When I told him to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance, he sat down. Uh, and in the middle of one conversation with him, I remember clearly him saying to me, you know what, lady, I could walk out of this school tomorrow and have a job in the mills making twice the money that you're making, so don't give me a hard time. And he was right about that. For about 10 more years, he was right, until the mills went down, and that was the end of that. Okay. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I can't get to everybody. Um, this was the entire swim team back in the 60s. Do you recognize anything that's unusual about the Alderdice swim team? And all <laughs> males. Oh, <I> know. <laughs> Every, that was the Alderdice swim team. There was no girls' swim team in those days. That was it. And then, some of you may remember that this was one of the most prestigious clubs at Alderdice, the Key Club, which was um, affiliated with the Kiwanis Club. Do you notice anything about this group? All boys. All boys, yes. And I want you to know that that all changed because I had a group of girls at Alderdice who wrote a letter to the Attorney General of Pennsylvania, and I have all the literature from them going back and forth demanding that the Civil Rights Act says that anybody in a public school cannot discriminate by sex. And they went to war. And the Attorney General supported them. And um, when push came to shove, the uh, key club was removed, not just from Alderdice, but from all of the schools in Pennsylvania 
until they finally went co-ed. And here is the picture of them. Notice how many girls there are now. What year did the girls do that? Yes, I want to name those girls because they have never gotten the um, thanks that they should have. This was 1973 and 74. Uh, if you remember any of these or know them, please tell them I remember them and I cannot say enough good things about them. They really worked to get the laws to apply. One was Lisa Cohen. Number two was Joanne Janetta. The third one was Elena Solari. And the fourth one was Barbara Klein. And I, like I said, I have all kinds of letters flying back and forth between the uh, State Attorney General and the Key Clubs and the Kiwanis Club and the lawyers for the Kiwanis Club and back and forth until the Key Club was pushed out of Pennsylvania until they allowed women to join. Um, I also would like to tell you in closing I had a lot of tremendous experiences at Alderdice, um, but there were some that were not so pleasant. Um, my car was vandalized several times. Twice my wallet was stolen out of my purse, which was in the drawer in my desk. Um, I have someone else to show you. This was a student of mine, John Lesko. Does anybody remember that name? Yes. Kill for Thrill murderers. He and his pal Michael Travaglia killed, when they were about 21, 22, uh, killed four people in eight days and were on death row. Well, his partner, Michael Travaglia, died about five years ago. This is how John Lusco looks today. Every once in a while, he will ask for a new trial or a hearing, and they listen to what he has to say for about 10 or 20 minutes, and they find him guilty of murder all over again, and back to prison he goes. Very sad end. And finally, I have to show you one of my most prized possessions that was slipped under my door when I was at lunch one day. Can we go to it? Can you see this? This was a note, poison pen note, that was slipped under my door. It says, it's payback. Careful, beware, bitch, it's your turn. And I kept it, as you can see, I had it laminated. Um, I think I know who, who did it, but I always wish that I did find out because I wanted to explain to them that bitch is spelled B-I-T-C-H and not B-I-C-T-H. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little uh, walk through the history of Alderdice, and if you have any final comments, I would love to hear them. Elaine Berkowitz, Ross, it was fabulous. Thank you for a lovely evening. Thank you. Oh, put the last screen on. <laughs> I think I'm going to have business cards made with that on, on it. Never underestimate an old lady who used to be a teacher. I love that. <laughs> and we are finished. If anybody has any more comments. Mrs. Sherman, you should do this again and do the Dr. McMurray years. Do the doc Dr. McMurray years um, for when he was uh, principal. Um, so you should just do this talk again, please. This is uh, Christine Gerard. <coughs> Here holds the horn chat now, but um, yeah, you should do what Dr. McMurray was principal. Mm -hmm. How did you happen?
going to save everything, Roz. Why were women gym teachers so upset about girls wearing slacks? I have no idea. You have to admit that we did have some rather odd gym teachers. Um, I remember, does anybody remember Mrs. Mazzarelli, the gym teacher? I had pneumonia at the end of ninth grade and my mother had to go to school to return my textbooks and to pick up my gym clothes. I was so sick with pneumonia that my doctor wouldn't let me go to the hospital. He came every day to my house to give me a penicillin shot in my butt. And I was really sick. And Mrs. Massarelli <coughs> yelled at my mother saying I was faking it to get out of taking swimming. <laughs> that was her. She was a piece of work. She would come into the teacher's room and there would be, we had a table with chairs around it and then there was a couch and a chair on the side. And if anybody was sitting on the couch, she would just say to them, get up, I want to lay down. And that's what she did. She pushed them off the couch and stretched out and took a nap for 30 minutes. <laughs> Any other comments? Grill marks on her butt. Did you hear? Did you read that, Elaine? I read that. I'll get you. <laughs> I see a lot of my former students here. I hope you are all well. Blitz, Mr. Blitz was another one. Yeah, boy, we had some extraordinary teachers, really. You want a part two? <laughs> this is Christine Gerhold Zahorkak. Zahorchak? Yes. Uh, maybe I can do something again another time. Um, I really, like I said, I had a lot of good experiences, but I also had some bad experiences. Um, but, you know, that's the way it is um, when you teach. But... Um, I got a lot of gratification, and I don't know, those of you who are my students, if you remember, whenever I had a kid that was giving me trouble, I would just stop teaching and I would stare at them, and I would say, John, did I ever tell you about the book I was writing? And John would say no, and I would say, it's a book about my students, I'm going to call it Students I Have Known. And every student that I taught is going to have one or two sentences. But you, John, you may get an entire page, maybe even a whole chapter. And everybody in the class would laugh, and then we would go on from there. Ross, how did you happen to save all that stuff? I mean, that's from the beginning. No, I didn't save it. I went to the... Um, to the archives that went through the yearbooks. Yeah, but, there were things you said but you know, I do have a sort of big plastic box of my mementos of my life, not just teaching, but everything else in my life. And I kept a lot of things. I got a lot of wonderful letters from students years after I had them, you know, telling me that I had made a difference in their lives. Um, a couple of them said that they had been suicidal in high school, they hated high school, and the only reason they got out of bed in the morning was to come to my class because they felt good about it. You know, the, those are the things, they certainly didn't put it in my paycheck, uh, but <laughs> those are the kind of things that are worth way more than money. So, if nobody has anything else, I guess we will adjourn.
I'll say oh, one. wait, one more. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's Eric Wagner. I, I have my that. email. I put my wait, email wait, at the end. Eric Wagner's. Oh, I I'm sorry? I remember Dr. Teal is a real gentleman. I liked him. Uh, I don't know how he was as a colleague or a principal, but as a student, um, I always liked him. And for some reason, I made the front page of the Sunday Pittsburgh Press one time. And we had 3,200 kids in the school. He found me in the hallway to congratulate me, and I never forgot that. So, 3,200 so kids, can you imagine? They think yeah. it's crowded with 1,500 now. Do you remember the second and third floor annex when it was back to back and belly to belly, and you had to fight your way through the second and third floor annex to get to your class? Oh, yeah. Mr. Fisher was like that too. I mean, he would come up to every student. He knew what sports you played. He knew, he'd always ask you, how was the game? How was the tennis? How was the whatever? He, he, he knew the music students, the play students. He just he knew what they all did. Yes, he did. Maybe yeah. because I was a teacher I don't, and I, I knew lots of principals there. Maybe that's why I don't remember who my principal was when I was in school. Raymond Bond, do you remember? Mr. McClellan is for most of the time. Okay. Well, the, biggest, the, character, the, the, the biggest character uh, that we, that Linda and I both had, we had a lot of characters. Uh, I would say it would be you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to be straightforward and, and honest. Uh, we remember so much about that class. I do remember uh, that you were kind enough to sit me next to Linda. So you can take some credit. For this, because I look forward well, to coming to your class. I did look actually, forward to coming to your class every day. I, mean, I had to, I had to cut my talk. I was going to say that there were several um, couples that I don't know if they met in my class, but they were in the same class and ended up getting married. You were one of them. Joel Siegel from Little Shoe Store married Debbie, who was in my World Cultures class, the two of them together. And there was a third couple who were in my AP class. I don't remember their names. They got married, but they sat in the last row, right in the middle. So when I was sitting in front of my desk, I had a straight shot to them. And I looked at this young man, put his hands on her knee, and I would look away and a few minutes Later, it would be a little higher up above the knee, and a little later, it was going a little higher up the knee. And I, I finally, you know, I was breaking out into a sweat. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I did have to talk to them. And they were mortally embarrassed and didn't do it anymore. But <laughs> just be clear, that was not me and Linda. <laughs> I, I was, I was, I, hard to believe, but I was actually too shy to even tell her how I felt about it. That was 10th grade. I had to wait two more years to come clean. Yep. But here you are. How long have you been married? We've been married 30 years next month. Wow. Congratulations. And live to tell about it. Exactly. Tell about it. Yeah. Well, we'll someday about tell, send me an email and tell me exactly yeah. what it is you do. I, I'll, I'll try to keep it short in a very organized fashion. Uh, but so we do talk about your class all the time in, in, in all sincerity. <laughs> but uh, I remember having to come to your class and making sure that I brought my A game. Uh, because if you called on me and I didn't have the answer or I wasn't prepared, oh, yes. that was a pretty bad day. So, yeah. Uh, a lot of things you prepared us for in your teachings, but how to be prepared for life was a big one for me, and I, I, I think we owe you a debt of gratitude. It was that. all about business. Listen, you know, I was teaching world culture, the history of the world, in 180 days. That's what I had to teach the history of the world. <laughs> of course, the irony was the year that we had that class is also when Mel Brooks released History of the World Part One, and I don't remember learning any of that stuff in your class, by the way. <laughs> no. Um, that's one of my major failings, and I admit to it. I did not follow the curriculum. I never ever, in the 33 years that I taught 
ever get past World War II. My students knew nothing about the years after World War II because I thought that other stuff that I was teaching was so much more important. You will remember the first couple weeks at the beginning of the year where we talked about frame of reference and we talked about developing a hypothesis and we talked about how you search for evidence and how you separate evidence from evidence and how you use the evidence to either prove your hypothesis or go back to square one and start over again. I mean, to me, that was vastly more important than the subject matter, but I had a tough time hiding from my supervisor that I was not teaching what I was supposed to be teaching. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming.